So uh, I'm Alberto Cusola, and I'm with the Data and Analytics Services Group at NERSC, um, where I specialize. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me start sharing the screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you all see my my screen here? I yes. So. Yes. So, thank you. Uh, so I specialize in data management and uh, data transfer performance. Uh, also known as input output. Uh, so in this session, I'll talk about best practices for uh, IO and NERSC, uh, in particular on the promoter system, uh, which will hopefully be beneficial for your uh, applications. So this is the uh, outline for this talk. Um, we'll have a bird's eye view on the uh, IO stack first, uh, and then I'll dig into uh, more useful sections for application developers. Um, and we'll see uh, a tool to debug IO performance issues or to profile first and then pro possibly debug it. Uh, and finally, we'll see some optimization for the NERSC file systems. So, um, so on your laptop, the, the route uh, to go from a, a path to the actual data on your drive may be uh, short, uh, but on parallel and distributed file systems of several petabytes of capacity, there are more layers in between. So we go from a productive interface like uh, Python, Spark, TensorFlow, which uh, provides a, a layer of, uh, of abstraction on top of the uh, files and, and, and data models that we use. Then we can move on into uh, higher level uh, IO libraries like HD5 or Parallel and HDF. And these provide a uh, abstraction and data port portability across systems. We, we then have uh, IO middleware uh, like uh, MPIO, that's the most famous. Uh, and it, it's the one used with, uh, when, you, when you do uh, MPI, and you and you and you work on files uh, doing collective IO. You you usually end up using MPIO even if you're uh, if you don't notice or if you're not uh, will. Uh, I can say if even if you're not um, even if you're not using uh, MPIO on 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 your own. You the the MPI stack will usually end up using MPIO uh, on on its own. Um, then there is another layer of IO forwarding, uh, so called, which uh, transforms or aggregates many uh, requests into, into larger requests and try to and tries also, also to reduce lock contention, um, and it is also performs a, as a bridge between the um, HPC system and the external storage. So, uh, in particular, at NERSC we use the Cray DVS. Um, with, uh, with on Cori with all the GPFS file systems. Um, and finally, the, the last layer before touching the hardware, basically, uh, are the parallel file systems, which um, provide some logical file model uh, to, to, uh, to the data. So uh, we use Luster at NERSC. Uh, and also GPFS. So moving on to the productive interface, uh, as you can see from from this from this uh, box, uh, the top right uh, in the top right corner, uh, one of the most used libraries uh, for storage in science is H5Py, um, which offers a, an abstraction over HDF5 calls. Um, so in, in the first block here, you can see that how to open an HDF5 file file with h5py in parallel mode using mpio so you basically import mpi for pi in python uh, and then you also import h5py obviously um, and then you need, you need to specify the driver and the communicator to uh, the h5py uh, interface uh, once a file has been opened in parallel uh, io can either be performed by each process independently or by coordinating with other processes uh, and we'll see more of these in a minute. 
So you probably are already familiar with Python. So this slide can be obvious, but we wanted to show you uh, how more, how more uh, compact Python and H5Py can be uh, compared to the HDF5 interface in C uh, using these um, equivalent codes. So the first 10 lines in Python uh, are roughly equivalent to the uh, uh, to these other uh, 35 more or less uh, lines in C uh, that you see here on the right. Uh, so, and these lines are just uh, setting up the MPI communicator and opening the file in, in a parallel mode. The following 20 lines are uh, in Python are creating some random data and storing it in the HDF5 file using collective IO. Uh, which is done in the same way here on the right uh, with the other 30 lines in C. And finally, the closure section in Python is just a couple of lines, while it's 10 more lines in C. And so this was just to show how much, how, how more verbose uh, B, uh, C can be. Uh, but does this ver verbosity and therefore granularity come at a cost? So, um, oops, sorry. Uh, so how much performance do we lose when using a more abstract interface for HDF5? So this, apologize, uh, uh, this study from 2017 at NERSC uh, shows that we lose about a third of performance when doing metadata operations in H5Py, uh, but we keep mostly the same performance when doing uh, IO, so either independent or collective IO, compared to the C version of HDF5. So it's a uh, it's useful if you want to program uh, faster, uh, since uh, the, I, the IO part of your uh, application should still perform uh, uh, at a high level compared to coding your entire application in C. So moving on to the high level IO libraries, as you can see here on, on the top right corner, we are moving down into this, the IO stack. Uh, the most common ones, uh, of these IO high level uh, IO libraries are probably HDF5 and parallel NetSDF, uh, which allow for uh, which allow users to model complex data relationships and dependencies that are especially suited for array based scientific data. So the following is a is a skeleton of code in a C to create and write into an HDF5 file serially. Um, it's uh, just a couple of lines. It's not the complete code, but if we want to convert this into a parallel uh, HDF5, uh, we just need to set up MPI in it, set up the communicator, and add some uh, some settings to this uh, file opening. For example, we are uh, here on this line here. We're we're um, we specifying the data set transfer property list. And in this data set transfer property list, we're uh, specifying the uh, HDF5 file uh, data set MPIO collective uh, option. So we're uh, working on this file in a collective mode. And we'll see uh, more about that in a, in a minute. Uh, there are lots of these uh, examples in the HDF5 documentation. So I invite you to uh, to browse it for more detail and more complete examples. Uh, so here are some useful links. You can start from the NERSC documentation. Uh, here are the, uh, the first two links. Uh, then I particularly recommend listening to the introduction to HDF5 for HPC by Scott, by Scott Breitenfeld, Breitenfeld uh, from the HDF5 group. Uh, and then another talk from uh, the Argon training program on extreme scale computing by Quincy Cozio, and obviously the HDF5 uh, documentation, official documentation. So moving down uh, further into the IO stack, we now reach the IO middleware. And so we may ask ourselves why more IO software? Uh, this layer provides portability across parallel file systems let's ask or let's the develop the developers uh focus on their application rather than spending time uh optimizing their application for the several parallel FS systems used on on different systems different uh, computing centers 
Um, so MPIO is the IO middleware used for the MPI uh, standard and works on POSIX files. Uh, so it allows developers to easily perform collective and or uh, non-blocking IO, for example. Um, yeah. So uh, if we want to uh, to study more detail what independent IO means, uh, is the independent IO is the one that we're probably most familiar with. Is the uh, that we are the one that we naively use when coding applications. Uh, so each MPI rank would take care of reading and writing their own data into their own uh, either single fiber process uh, uh, files or into a pre-allocated uh, uh, file and then using offsets. Uh, so independent IO is cheap in development time because it, you just need to take the rank ID and write a uh, uh, either a single fiber process or at a specific or a specific off offset depending on the on the um, on the rank ID and can also be efficient for certain workloads, especially at small scale. Uh, so yeah, as we said, independent IO doesn't necessarily mean that each process writes their own file. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we do single fiber process. Uh, processes can also be uh, instructed to write into a pre-allocated file uh, and then by using offset. So let's say every process should write 100 megabytes. So the first uh, rank will start from uh, offset zero and then the second rank will start from offset, offset 100 megabytes and then so on. So these uh, writing at different offset, offsets comes with a uh, file locking costs. So the file system has to lock the file on a uh, on, on a specific processor, uh, so that to the because uh, it doesn't allow multiple processors to write into the same file at the same time for uh, data integrity. Um, that's usually the case with the uh, with the uh, file systems. So these file locking costs can become high uh, at a large scale. So another alternative to independent IO is collective IO, uh, which aims at reducing communication overhead by making each process communicate their intentions, uh, and letting a few coordinator or aggregator ranks merge these IO requests into larger requests. Uh, this allows lower software layers to perform optimizations. Uh, for example, read ahead, uh, reading ahead la um, large chunks of data uh, when there is a, a read operation or uh, reducing file logs when writing. So if these, these uh, collective IO usually means that all processors uh, or either uh, one processor per node collects all the IO from the other processors and then writes it down as a, uh, as a single write operation and the same reverse obviously for reading. Uh, so each application has different pattern, patterns, but collective IO usually increases performance of many applications. Here are some, some more uh, links for MPI uh, IO tutorials. Um, oops. And so moving on to, uh, to optimizing IO. So when we want to optimize IO, there are some questions that we need to answer. So for example, uh, how many num number of processes are right into these uh, to our files, how many number of files we have, uh, what's the size oops, per file, uh, what's the frequency of the uh, IO, uh, etc. So uh, on older file systems like uh, community, the community file system, uh, there are also some considerations that need to be done about doing uh, contiguous IO against uh, non-contiguous IO or um, also, also known as uh, rand random uh, access uh, IO. Uh, but on newer, on newer storage, like the old flash promoter scratch, uh, doing random IO is more uh, permissive, is more, uh, they're not so such high cost as shown here in this, in this uh, example. Um, yeah, so here are some uh, H5Pi and MPIO tips and tricks that you can try for your applications. Uh, so one simple trick is 
to use the latest version of uh, H5Pi, uh, the application, the, the, the H5Pi and the HD5 uh, uh, library behind H5Pi can support. So uh, we, we already tested this uh, in H5Pi using the most modern format uh, when creating uh, one single HD5 file with uh, 8,000 objects inside on one processor produce, um, improves the performance uh, more, more than twice uh, than, than using the, the most compatible uh, format. Another uh, hint, or yeah, this is actually it's called MPIO hints. Uh, and with the MPI CH, which is the MPI layer uh, provided by the Cray uh, MPI, when you compile your application using the Cray MPI and the Cray compilers, you usually get MPI CH and, and pitch. And you can uh, tune the MPIO hints using uh, environment variables, which is very uh, uh, useful. So, for example, by setting uh, the collective buffering um, at enable uh, for write, writes and disable the data saving, usually can, uh, which is an older uh, implementation of collecting buffering, you can get some, some improvement. And I invite you to, to try this on your application. Um, so, how do we know that IO is? slowing our application down. So at NERSC, we offer Darshan, which is a lightweight IO tracing tool uh, developed by the Argonne National Lab. It's, lo it's loaded and uh, automatically for, for all users at NERSC as part of the, of the default modules. Uh, and all applications compiled at NERSC using the Cray compiler wrappers. So the CC or the capital CC and FTN, for example, all those uh, compilers. Uh, automatically inject Dasha library into the final executable, which then starts collecting data at runtime. So for, uh, but this is only for uh, MPI applications. Uh, we invite you to keep Dasha loaded. The only known issues are when you want to profile your application with other profilers, uh, since Dasha can obfuscate certain calls. So in that case, uh, uh, users found that disabling Darshan before compiling the application produces produced more um, clear um, executables. So Darshan logs are stored in a special directory on Permata Scratch, and they're archived by year, month, and day. Uh, there are scripts available to parse the data. So with a Darshan parser, you can parse the data on the command line, or you can also produce a, a PDF report using the Darshan job summary script. There is also a new Python package available to uh, more easily analyze Darshan logs. Uh, in our documentation, here are the, the top link. We uh, provide more details also on how to en enable Darshan for non MPI applications. And feel free to contact us if you, if you, have, if you want more information or have more questions. So uh, finally, we reached the parallel file systems, and please already talked about them. So here are ordered by, by uh, speed, uh, let's say. Um, so uh, the file systems and tape archive at NERSC are designed with different use cases in mind. Uh, this just wants to be another reminder that both core and Permata file systems are, uh, sorry, Permata um, scratch file systems are purged often. So uh, never keep critical data only on them for a long time. Always and we all, um, I like to take this time to invite you to uh, keep a copy of your critical data at another location than NERSC and possibly geographically distant for disaster recovery. Um, so finally, moving to uh, fo focusing on the most performant file system, in this case, P Scratch, uh, which can provide, uh, which provides 35 petabytes of usable storage space over almost 4,000 flash drives and can reach an aggregated bandwidth of more than five terabytes a second and four million IOPS, IO per second, IO operations per second. Uh, so the default striping is set at one, which actually means that data is not striped. Uh, each file will be stored on a single OST. So be it a one kilobyte text file or a 20 terabyte file from a simulation or a, a data set. Uh, 
if you uh, set these files on the, on the on the default striping, they will be striped on a single uh, OST on a single disk or a single flash drive, actually. Um, so configuring an uh, ad hoc striping can provide a lot of benefits if we know in advance what file size our application reads and writes. And there are some uh, uh, more details here in our documentation. Um, yeah, finally, so when to use striping, uh, as Lisa already um, explained, you, you use striping on medium to large files um, or on large files when doing independent IO on very large files. Uh, and MV doesn't restrict existing files, so you need to uh, set uh, striping on a oops, sorry, set the striping on a directory and copy the files into the directory to in order to to restripe uh, the files. And this is an example using a assuming, for example, twenty four gigabyte HD five input files. Uh, you may want to stripe the directory as medium. Uh, striping, and then copy the 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 existing files into this stripe directory to uh, get them striped over um, over a medium uh, size of OST, uh, medium number of OSTs. So uh, finally, some final best practice notes uh, on data alignment, especially for independent I/O. Uh, the I/O should match the file system granularity. So on on uh, Scratch on Permata Scratch the, uh, the file system granularity is the um, stripe width of the of the of the system, which is set at one megabyte by default. But these can be configured with the LFS. Um, you should also combine operations using Collective I/O if possible. You should try that it out on your application. Um, I also invite you to profile your application for AEO. If you if, if it takes a long time, and maybe you suspect that the uh, the, the computing part is not uh, so relevant, maybe there there are some AEO optimizations that can be done. And so I invite you to use Darshan to uh, to optimize that, or to to uh, profile the application and then hopefully optimize that. Um, another uh, another. Best practice is to aggregate small files into larger files whenever possible. Uh, so this reduces metadata overhead, and uh, and also can can uh, um, read ahead optimizations can be performed by, by the file system. And another uh, another suggestion is here is to uh, do not write thousands of files into into a single directory. Uh, because this has performance impact on your applications and also uh, other applications. Uh, and a specific uh, tip for HDF5, you can use compact storage when working with the small data. So if you're working with the less than less than 64 uh, kilobytes, uh, you can store this data into the metadata layer by using this comp compact storage. And when uh, data is inside the metadata layer, this can be cached uh, and so can provide uh, faster access to your data. And with this, I conclude. Um, any questions? Or maybe I can provide questions in the in the shared doc. Thank you.